So my plan is to test out something new. So this is a very brand new work from our group. And this is the first time I'm uh, giving a talk on this topic. So uh, my group has been in interested for the past several years in understanding uh, growth physiology of microorganisms. So how microorganisms regulate growth and uh, movement. Um, and uh, so, so this is a sort of a new theoretical framework that we have formulated, which, which I'm calling the dynamic energy allocation model. And it's a framework that allows us to understand how living organisms consume energy to drive growth and morphogenesis, okay? And this, this work was done by my, uh, sort of started by my former student, Diana, and then uh, uh, sort, sort of taken forward and uh, by Ariana, okay? And it's available as preprint on BioArchive, okay? Uh, so, so, so the idea is that all living organisms face the challenge of continuously investing energy to drive growth, biomechanical activities, and the maintenance of mass okay, mm -hmm. and structure. So energy uptake and allocation strategies has been studied uh, uh, for a long time in ecology, especially for birds and mammals. Uh, and, and a lot of things are already known about how uh, energy uptake is allocated between different tasks, for instance. For, for, for instance, the plot here is showing how food assimilation rate of different mammals and birds uh, change with body mass. And what, what you notice is that there's a sublinear increase of uh, the, the rate of assimilation of food with body mass, right? And this is intimately connected to how the metabolic rate of organisms scale with uh, the size of the organisms. And the so-called three-fourth power law formulated by Kleiber, okay? And uh, what this means is that there, there is um, sort of a sublinear increase of metabolic rate with uh, body size, right? And um, so if you combine that with the energy that's required to maintain the structure and the uh, uh, mass of a system, which we should scale linearly with the mass, you see that, you know, um, sort of higher organisms slow down growth as they increase in size and eventually they stop growth, right? And um, so uh, a lot of different um, modeling frameworks have been introduced uh, in the past decades to understand sort of growth regulation during, uh, uh, you know, uh, development of multicellular organisms. And they are, they're, they're sort of broadly called the energy budget models, right? Um, however, these models are not very adequate to understand microorganism growth, okay? So while they explain very well um, um, growth behavior of high organisms, birds and mammals, et cetera, but you know, so uh, my, microbial growth physiology is very different, okay? Um, so one main difference is that, uh, for, the, for example, um, if, if you think about bacteria, bacteria have a very short li lifespan and they exhibit sort of robust exponential growth, okay? So there is no slowing down of growth with body size as uh, I showed for um, you know higher organisms, um, but you know they 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 sort of grow robustly exponentially, okay, um, and which 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 means that the rate of growth increases as you as 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 you grow larger and larger, right? Furthermore, what 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 has been known for the past six decades is that there is some something called a size law of bacterial cells. Is that uh, the 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 size of bacterial cells increases super linearly with growth rate almost exponentially. Um, and um, furthermore, uh, if you think if you uh, think about metabolic rate, right? How fast do uh, prokaryotes such as bacteria consume energy, right? And that is very fast, like it's it's super linear. So here, the scaling exponent, if you focus on the bottom left corner of the screen, metabolic rate of bacteria is is goes as one point seven two powers of mass, okay which is very different from the three-fourth scaling that we see for you know, uh, mammals, okay? Um, so all, all of these behaviors are very distinct from uh, high organisms. Uh, furthermore, bacteria can, you know, they're, they're very adaptive. They can re readily adapt their size and shape due to environmental fluctuations, changes, et cetera, right? So what we discovered and others is that, you know, bacteria sort of maintain uh, robust geometric scaling laws between how the surface area change with the volume in different growth conditions, um, the so-called shape law. And uh, here, here we're seeing data from E. coli that sort of follow a sort of a very robust uh, 
shape equation uh, in different growth conditions, okay, where surface area is two pi times volume to the power two thirds, right? And uh, this is connected to the maintenance of aspect ratio, right? Uh, so such scaling laws emerge if you maintain aspect ratio of rod-like systems. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, what, what happens is that as, as you change the growth rate of the medium, right? So bacteria tend to reduce their surface to volume ratio as uh, to increase their fitness, okay? So, um, so all, all of these sort of indicate you have um, very well-defined um, physiological laws in bacteria that are very distinct from our organisms. So we need we sort of need to new theoretical approaches, okay? So here are my list of questions that I would like to address with uh, sort of a new framework that I'm going to talk about in a second, but um, and and uh, you 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 can add to that. But sort of my main interests are understanding how bacterial cells allocate energies for various physiological tasks, for example, growth, maintenance, uh, uh, shape regulation, etc. And how do such allocation strategies depend on growth conditions? Right? How do we explain the emergence of exponential growth? What's the interdependence between cell size, shape, and growth? Um, how do we explain metabolic scaling of cell size? And, 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 and if you have such a model, can we explain how growth efficient are bacteria, right? So, um, and, and, and can we use that model to study dynamics, right? So if, if, if the system is driven out of equi equilibrium by environmental perturbations, how do we explain the response, physiological response of cells, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, there are some existing frameworks who, which uh, address some of these questions, okay? And I just wanted to briefly mention what they are, okay? So you can, um, just for the audience who may not be familiar with the field, um, so in terms of existing framework, you, you can think about sort of bottom-up approaches, sort of microscopic models, and these are really large-scale models. You write down uh, reactions for all the macromolecules inside the cell, and you simulate them, and you can um, uh, do sort of wholesale modeling of um, uh, you know cell growth and physiology, right? But these are computationally very expensive, right? You are thinking about solving uh, tens of thousands of differential equations, right, to actually uh, understand growth. Okay. Uh, while this has been successful, but this is not what we want to do as physicists. We we, we want to think about more post-grain approaches. Okay, and um, and two sort of uh, post-grain approaches are, are very have been uh, sort of uh, popular. One of them is sort of resource allocation models, right? How do cells allocate ribosomes to do uh, to synthesize different sectors of proteins inside the cell? And, and they have been very successful in explaining growth physiology of bacteria, but they are sort of devoid of um, physical um, in, in, uh, uh, physical activities, right? So they are, they, they are not well equipped to describe sort of mechanical behavior or all those things, right? And on the other hand, you also have mechanical models of growth, uh, and they have described how, for example, cell shape uh, is regulated, and uh, you know how, how how it depends on mechanical forces, etc. So we really want something that combines mechanics and biochemical regulation, right? And 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 to do that, we thought sort of a unified approach could be sort of starting to think about energy, okay, like in the physical sense of the term. So that's why we introduced something called the energy allocation theory, which we also call as eat, okay? Because bacteria is eating uh, food to do all tasks, okay? So the eat framework um, uh, starts with the principle of energy flux balance, okay? Which, which basically is a, a very simple constraint on the system that the rate of energy intake is equal to the rate of energy expenditure, right? Through metabolism, and then some, some fraction of the energy is stored, okay? okay? And, um, the energy that's used by the cell to drive metabolic processes could be used for different tasks. So for, for example, you, you can use some fraction of the energy for uh, maintenance of structure, shape, right? Some fraction of the energy can be used to drive growth. Some can be used for cell division, which is the rep reproduction of the bacteria. Um, and uh, some amount of energy will be lost as heat, right? And um, 
depending on your need, you can also add several other um, sort of sectors, like energy sectors, right? So if you want to model, let's say, battery or locomotion, you can also add an energy sector responding to movement, right? So this is, a, at, the, at the moment, a very general framework where, you know, depending on um, your need, you can add different things to it, okay? But um, so to, to start building any sort of thermodynamic models, you need to think about state variables, okay? So the next big thing is you have to decide on what are the state variables upon which you will write these energy functions, okay? Um, and um, so let me, let, me, let me give a few examples of how to sort of think about state variables of these systems. And depending on the complexity and your need, you can uh, sort of choose your own state variables that you think are appropriate, okay? So here I'm thinking about growth of bacterial cells, right? And what we want to do is we want to represent the energy sectors of the cell as functions of some, some sort of micro, macro state variables that I'm calling Q, right? Sort of inspired by you know, classical mechanics where you know, we think about generalized coordinates to define uh, the dynamics of a system, right? So the state variables could be sort of uh, geometric degrees of freedom that describe the shape and size. And, you know, for example, if you think about, if you have a spherical cell, you can just use the radius of the cell as its geometric state variables. But if you have rod-like cells such as E. coli, you know, it has two degrees of freedom, the radius and the length. And, it, you know, you, you can also sort of use it to model more complex shapes such as in uh, secret centers, which is curved and has variable width along its uh, contour, right? Uh, so um, those geometric degrees of freedom, uh, so, so the energies will depend on that. In addition, uh, the cell is a bag of different um, uh, macromolecules, right? So you can also introduce chemical variables in the system, and those will be abundance of macromolecules. So here I'm showing an example. Let's say I'm interested in modeling two macromolecules, the blue one, let's call them ribosomes, the green one, let's call them FTSZ, which, are, which form a division ring around the cell. And you know you can and, and let's call their abundance x one and x two. So you can sort of uh, formulate your equations in terms of those variables, right? And you can keep adding to that if you want, right? Uh, so once we have set the state variables, the next step is to define what are the cellular energy components, right? And more importantly, the the energies will depend on cell morphology as well as biochemistry, okay? So let me give an example of a very, very, very simplified model of a sort of minimal model of growth. And, and, and here we are worried about, let's say the mechanics due to target pressure and sort of strain energy in the cell wall, how energy is dissipated and how energy is taken in and how energy is stored, right? So um, in a very simplified model, we, we assume that the energy intake is proportional to the surface area of the cell, right? And epsilon is the, energy per unit surface area for intake. So that epsilon could depend on, let's say the concentration of nutrients or transporters on the cell surface. Um, and S is the surface area, right? Um, and, and then um, how do we model the energy that's stored? So we, we assume that uh, the amount of energy stored in a cell is proportional to its volume, right? So bigger the cell, it has more stored energy, right? Um, um, you can of course think about more, um, sophisticated model where the stored energy could sort of spatially vary across the cell. But uh, let's say for a sort of a first pass, we think about that stored energy is given to the volume, right? So, so once we have that, we can define sort of the mechanical energy components, right? So there is a huge osmotic pressure difference between the inside and the outside in a bacterial cell, which is called a target pressure. So we add that, um, you know, so bacterial cell ha has to maintain its Curvature, so we have some bending energy on the cell surface and also some strain energy due to stretching of the cell wall, right? Uh, I'm not explicitly writing down those uh, formula here. They are a bit involved, but I uh, ask you to check the preprint, right? And one, once once we write down the mechanical energy, we, we, we also need to think about how energy uh, um, uh, is allocated to um, various macromolecules. And you know we need to think about protein synthesis, growth, and division, right? Um, so, so the energy to synthesize a molecule is simply proportional to the abundance of the molecules, and sort of uh, you know we we write uh, you know, that this energy to synthesize a molecule is basically some chemical potential 
uh, mu i times the abundance, right? So this is very similar to how you write free energy in thermodynamics, right? And um, so, you know, uh, there, are, there could be different types of uh, macromolecules that you are interested in modeling. So for example, we are interested in modeling the cell division process. So you, we can introduce uh, division proteins uh, to sort of talk about how division proteins are synthesized within a cell. And so you can write down a similar energy functional, right? Mu. So mu is the sort of energy released by adding one molecule. Okay, so that, that's why we call it a chemical potential. Um, so once we have that, we have to think about how energy is dissipated and energy dissipation basically, so for the mechanical components of the cell, we assume that the energy dissipated is proportional to the strain rate, square of the strain rate. And this is sort of uh, inspired by, you know, approaches, you know, um, in fluid dynamics, we assume that uh, energy dissipation rate is square of the strain rate, right? So, and this is sort of discrete formulation of that when we talk about uh, shape dynamics. And the energy dissipated due to biochemicals is proportional to the rate of change of these biochemicals, okay? Uh, square of that, okay? So, so, so with all that, we have, let's say, defined the minimal model of a cell, okay? And we, we want to see if it can grow or not, or if it can reasonably reproduce some of the uh, behaviors we know for bacteria, okay? But we just have one equation that I showed earlier is, is that the principle of flux balance, that's really a constraint for the cell, right? And that's not enough to sort of formulate uh, equations of motion, right? And then we come down to sort of the crux of the model, which is the optimization strategy, okay? So, so organisms cannot simultaneously maximize all of its life functions. So depending on the need, it can maximize what, uh, maximize its, energy for a particular task, okay? So let's say we are interested in um, uh, bacteria that's growing in moderate to rich nutrient conditions, right? And in those conditions, it has been shown that bacteria um, uh, likes to evolve uh, to maximize their growth rate, okay? And based on that, um, so we, we assume that the bacteria is uh, optimizing the growth flux, okay? And so, uh, so we, we can calculate what the growth flux or the rate of change in growth energy is based, because we have defined the other energy components. And then we can optimize that for each of the state variables. And that can yield us equations of motion for the cell, okay? Which is pretty cool, right? So with this optimization strategy, you can work out what the, how the shape, size, and the concentration of biomolecules change over time, right? So for example, what, what you get automatically is exponential growth. That, 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 that just falls out of this uh, uh, model. So where, where the length of the cell is growing exponentially at some rate kappa, that depends on the size, the radius of the organism and other factors such as how much nutrients are imported, how much energy is stored, et cetera. So it can robustly predict um, um, the emergence of exponential growth and, and we, we can also sort of work out a sort of free uh, phase diagram for that, you know, so growth is not possible at, uh, for all values of energy intake. So you, you need some minimum amount of nutrients to sort of start growth for a given value of stored energy, okay? Um, so, um, yeah, so with, with this growth optimization principle, you can work out equations for, for example, how the division protein abundance change with cell size. So here, for example, X is the abundance of uh, uh, division proteins, uh, which reach a threshold abundance when the cell is about to replicate, okay? And uh, at cell division, what happens is this, this, this uh, division proteins reach a threshold abundance and, and their, their rate of change is proportional to the length of the cell, okay? And that, that's quite consistent with what is known for FTSG uh, molecules, okay? And, and uh, et cetera. Uh, so un unlike length uh, of the cell, the ra radius of the cell uh, does not increase uh, during a cell cycle because we know, know that bacteria actually equally grow uh, along its length, but the radius remains fixed in a given nutrient condition is because that you know, radius will sort of reach a steady state, which is dictated by this effective potential that it is sitting in. So in, in fast growth conditions, 
the effective potential has a minimum at sort of a higher radius than in a slow growth condition. And that's consistent with what you know for how cell size changes with growth rate, right? And uh, we, we know that cell size increases with growth rate. And, and that, that, that is um, a sort of a, a result of this model that, you know, it can accurately predict how cell radius and length they uh, change with growth rate. For example, the length of the cell sort of increases super linearly on the, almost exponentially with growth rate. So here, what I'm showing is sort of the average newborn cell length that we uh, calculate by, you know, sim simulating uh, multiple generations of growth with this model, okay? Um, yeah, so, so then we fit the model to existing uh, single cell data on bacterial growth. And by fitting the model, we can actually extract a lot of the model parameters, okay? So that's very important because not all the model parameters are fixed. Some of them depend on growth conditions, okay? So for example, the, uh, the rate of uh, synthesis of division proteins, it increases with the rate of growth. And that, that, that can be thought of as a sort of a principle of balanced biosynthesis, okay? And energy intake also increases with, okay? Um, so all of this is great. And, and so with this model, so one um, key feature of the model that, that I wanted to learn is that how is energy allocated between different tasks, right? So, uh, so we can calculate. So once the model is benchmarked with experimental data, et cetera, we can calculate how energy is allocated between different sectors of the cell, right? So here you see a graph of different energy sectors and how it changes with growth rate. Um, so let's, let, let's focus on the key takeaways from this. So first of all, what we see is that they're, they're, the, the rate of energy allocated to growth increases with growth rate, which we expect, while the rate of energy that's allocated to uh, division decreases with growth rate. And such a trade-off has been observed before by us and others that, you know, uh, th that um, there is a negative correlation between how fast cells grow and how fast they allocate resources to uh, division, and that explains why cells grow larger as the growth rate increases, right? Few other takeaways is that, you know, cells um, uh, increase storage in slow growth uh, conditions, you know, when, when nutrient energy is not available, they sort of uh, uh, shuffle material to storage, okay? Secondly, you have an optimum growth rate at which you minimize mechanical energy cost. And um, the model also allows us to calculate how, how fast the cell is dissipating energy. And based on that, we find that the growth efficiency of an equal is around 80 to 85%, okay? So, uh, so these are very interesting predictions that could be uh, tested experimentally. Additionally, the model also naturally reproduces why the metabolic rate is super linear. Um, and this is the first, first explanation for that. And, and, and the idea is that you can approximate the metabolic rate as proportional to cell size times growth rate. And because the cell size increases super linearly with growth rate, metabolic rate also increases super linearly with growth rate, which is very distinct from what we know for mammals and et cetera, right? Um, so yeah, so um, uh, yeah. Um, in the remaining couple of minutes, I just wanted to say, um, a few more cool things you can do with the model. So it can not only explain steady state growth, but you know one of our interests is to model growth out of equilibrium, right? So um, the energy allocation model can actually predict response to uh, dynamic changes in nutrient conditions. So you know with the model, uh, we can capture um, behavior of the cell during nutrient upshift, which means that let's say you dynamically switch from a, a sort of low nutrient medium to a high nutrient medium, and you, you wanna see how the growth rate and cell shape changes in response to that. The model can accurately capture that where you know we introduce a time dependence to the energy intake, okay? Depending on the nutrient concentration. So it, it, it can actually capture nutrient upshift, nutrient downshift, okay, which is, uh, we see sort of an asymmetric response as, as is known experimentally. Um, not only that, uh, so these are actually cellular response to sort of uh, what I would categorize as biochemical perturbations to the cell. But, but since the model has both mechanical and biochemical components, it can also handle uh, um, how the cell would respond to mechanical stress, okay? So 
you can you can also study uh, response of the cell to osmotic shocks, right? So let's say let's say you change the osmolarity of the external medium, it, it impacts the osmotic pressure difference. So that as a result, the cell size and shape changes in to adapt to the osmotic shocks. Okay, and 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 our model actually, uh, if you read the details in the preprint, it can ca capture a wide spectrum of osmotic shock responses that has been seen in various organisms. For example, in E. coli, it has been seen in response to a hyperosmotic shock that there's a sharp decrease in growth rate followed by an overshoot and then relaxation to equilibrium, okay? And, 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 and we see that our model can capture that if we assume some sort of osmotic regularity of the target pressure in the cell, okay? Cool. So, um, so I, I encourage you to sort of um, read our preprint where we sort of di discuss in detail uh, some of the model uh, uh, results for hyperosmotic shock, hypoosmotic shock, et cetera, and how it can be applied to different organisms, okay? Um, yeah, so I think I'm almost out of time. I just want to summarize some of the uh, key conclusions. So one is that the energy allocation theory provides a general framework to, to study growth and morphogenesis of organisms. So here I give you an examples on bacteria, but you can also adapt it to other organisms, right? Um, so, uh, one one key thing about uh, the 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 model is that it can predict energy allocation strategies in different growth environment, uh, and it provides a unified framework to study both mechanical and biochemical perturbations to the cell. Okay, so right now we are, are working on understanding response to antibiotics. Okay, so and uh, how it impacts shape changes. And it has the potential to be generalized to different organisms and optimization strategies. So for example, one of the optimization strategies we implemented here was growth optimization. That may not be true when, for example, when a bacteria is starving, in, uh, under starvation, bacteria might want to uh, optimize maintenance, okay? So uh, our model can allow you to do that. And in different, uh, depending on the optimization strategies, you'll get different equations of motion that will allow you to evolve the shape and uh, the um, content of the cell in time, okay? Um, so thank you, and I, I just wanted to summarize, uh, sort of end by thanking Ariana and Diana for contributing to this work and the funders.